go ahead and get started. Um, I'll try to, try to keep everybody engaged uh, as we uh, recover from lunch. Um, just as a little bit of a refresher before we broke for, for lunch, um, we're essentially going through the key activities of the planning timeline for your pre-disaster recovery plan. Um, we've talked about the uh, define the, the core recovery team um, and some of the other players that we want to uh, incorporate into that. You know, as a reminder, um, it's, it's not just planners like Shane um, that, you know, that know emergency management stuff um, or, or like yourselves that, um, you know, focus on the emergency management side of it, but all these other players and other perspectives that we want to bring in. <coughs> Excuse me. So as we get into the step two or activity two, your stakeholder and partner engagement. So that's basically how we expand from your core planning team, which you want to you want to manage that, you know, your core planning group. You, you don't want it to get too out of control and have 40, 50 people in, as part of that. So you have a core planning team of those key stakeholders, um, and it's going to vary by your, you know, your municipality, wh who that is, um, who you have on staff, again, based on size and uh, 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 size of the staff that you probably already have, um, as well as the, you know, the characteristics of your uh, community and again, I'll use an example when we talk about maybe Hershey, uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania. You know, you would possibly, uh, I don't know if they do, but possibly Derry Township would might bring in, you know, somebody from Hershey Entertainment Resorts or Hershey Foods because they're such a c critical element of the community um, to have them involved in the planning process as a core member rather than a stakeholder. Um, so they're part of the core planning team because they have that capability. They have planners. Um, and emergency managers on their staff. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. The core, core team is not a set, uh, finite, you know, scripted. It has to be these four or five or six people. It's up to you, but, it, it, you know, it's always good to think a little bit outside the box. And really, again, the most important thing for you is that it's not just an emergency management function, but you bring in the economic folks and the uh, uh, comprehensive planning folks and the land use folks within your uh, organization so that at least the core team is diverse and then really get it diverse with your, um, your, your stakeholder engagement. So, um, and again, this all kind of varies as well as how big your, uh, your, your stakeholder engagement is, um, how large the scope is. Um, so, you know, if you're gonna engage hundreds of people, then, you know, we're talking conference room or theater kind of engagement um, while you're uh, discussing with them. Um, and it's always good too, when you think about getting a larger group together, is then breaking folks down into working groups uh, based on whatever sector that they represent. So, you know, you could get a couple hundred people and you go, well, that's un unmanageable to try to do planning with, but then we can say, okay, so everybody that's interested in the housing sector go this way or economic sector go this way, and then you do sponsored focus groups um, and, or conversations, and at least you're drawing out what are the key factors that people were thinking about, concerned about, and impacts upon their sector that they're responsible for. So when we talk about non-governmental organizations and everybody thinks about, you know, nonprofits, but what are some of your other non-governmental organizations that you're going to want to partner with when you're do, uh, developing these plans? What's that? Utilities. Utilities is a really good one. Excellent. Okay. They're non-governmental, um, but they're a big player. Yeah. Okay. Hmm? Schools. Educational institutions, so it's not just your uh, primary schools, but if you have any universities um, within your footprint or, or close to your footprint. And I tell you that right now, um, we're really expanding here at the state government and my, my responsibilities, um, engagements with universities. And universities are looking for it. Penn State, for example, uh, if you're not aware, I mean, we have, there, there's what, 20 satellite campuses for Penn State. The, the directive and the guidance from President Barron from the university is that the, the, he wants the students and the faculty being more engaged in their communities. And that doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, fundraisers and things like that. That means, and, and, and I'm seeing it, I'm working with college professors where it's, hey, we're going to prescribe a uh, program for a graduate student that is working directly with the community for problem X. Okay, so the student is getting real world uh, experience that they can put on their resume at, in addition to their education and you're getting a service provider for free. Um, I work with uh, Penn State School of Architecture 
their uh, Institute of Science and Technology um, and their Land Use and Sustainability uh, Center. I was out at Shippensburg University um, uh, a couple weeks ago and I met with their folks and they call it CLUS, uh, Center for Land Use and Sustainability. Um, and the same thing goes for Shippensburg, that they are interested in starting to partner with and looking for opportunities to par partner with local governments um, so that, you know, again, you get that symbiotic relationship. So it's one thing to always think about. Um, universities are huge, uh, you know, just, just even if you can get a professor with subject matter expertise on something um, and they have published a book or, you know, lectures on subject X, um, especially the land use, um, sustainable development, all those types of things, that's all being developed out of the university. So I highly recommend bringing someone like that in to your, um, uh, your shareholder, uh, uh, shareholder or stakeholder engagement. Um, and they're anxious to do it. They really, really are. They're not doing it begrudgingly like uh, President Barron says we have to do it. No, they're looking for opportunities to do it. Um, and I have contacts with Penn State if you're, if you, you know, after this, if you want to um, get with me and, and are all, you know, you're always welcome to send me an email follow up. So, um, so what are the roles of the government agencies then as we're, as we're going through this planning? basically to serve you, right? I mean, it's at least state government agencies and federal government agencies. We're here to provide service and uh, expertise, funding if possible, all right? But basically, you know, move, carry the water for you. Um, and then your external partnerships. So, um, and we kind of covered this a little bit, I guess maybe with uh, NGOs and, and non-governmental organizations, but, you know, your partners can be your uh, neighboring communities. Or if you're a bur borough and the, the township um, can be a partnership. Um, you part, maybe partner, private-public partnership is growing huge, so we talked a little bit about, you know, a large employer in your community, in your footprint, um, might be somebody that you consider partnering with. So again, it's thinking a little bit outside the box, but trying to be as inclusive as possible um, and think about all the different stakeholders that you have. Okay, so we're going into activity three, so now we, we're doing a, basically identifying what our risks are, it's, you know, conducting risk assessment. All of you are familiar with that. You're all in emergency management, so probably don't have to belabor that uh, too much. But identify your hazards and then assess what your risks are associated with it. Obviously, in Pennsylvania, we've talked about number one is flooding. <laughs> Bless you. Uh, but that's commonwealth-wide. That's not every community, uh, certainly. Obviously, we're all at risk for uh, major snowstorms. We learn from Sandy, hurricanes, et cetera. So, and then there's all the other outliers like terrorism, et, um, et cetera. So, I don't need to talk about this one really all that much more, I'm assuming, for you folks. Um, and then as we continue moving forward, we kind of I kind of hit on this earlier when I was going down through the steps, but then, okay, and it's, again, I apologize, I relay a lot of things uh, to the military experience, but you know, your threats, is, uh, you know, the, the last step was identifying your threats or the enemy that's, that, that you're facing. This is now figuring out who you are, okay? Where, what are our capabilities? And what are our shortcomings? Um, and then trying to figure out how to do those uh, or deal with those, you know, and, and the same, <coughs> that's your organization and staffing and your financial situation, all right? Uh, so what are some of the, the uh, tools that you have uh, at your disposal that can help with this step? Exactly, ordinances, your, your zoning, your, uh, 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 any regulations that you have, um, all those types of things. And like I said uh, earlier in the morning, that that's a really big one right now in Pennsylvania when you start talking about floodplain ordinances. You know, really hitting that hard across the board. And if you're not feeling that pressure, if you're not getting that, um, you should be um, because of things like uh, the, the remapping the f that FEMA has been doing, um, the changes from bigger waters uh, and, and grim waters, um, you know, and, and trying to figure out a way that we can better protect our folks and help save them uh, money in the long run because, you know, believe it or not, we're still building in the floodplains. Um, so, but are we doing building to one foot above uh, uh, base flood elevation, two feet, three feet? Um, and then that later translates into if you want to become a CRS community, um, how do your, uh, your zoning and your community affect that? 
We also talked about um, uh, the other plans that you already have done, your emergency management plan, um, your land use plan, your comprehensive plan, et cetera. So now moving on, um, so we've you know, taken a look at what our threats are, uh, we've taken a look at ourselves, now we're starting to develop a little bit of a plan and actually how we're going to deal with a disaster um, should we face one. So obviously early on, we're gonna look at our leadership positions. Um, now we have some that are, are giving us, <coughs> given to us, you have a borough manager or mayor, you have township supervisors, county commissioners, et cetera. So, you know, that's, those are key. But then we talked about uh, having a local disaster recovery manager. Where does that person come from? What is their skill set needed? LMI um, published a very, very good document, actually two complementary documents, a staffing guide and then a positions library. I have those hung on my website, and by the time we're done, I'll make sure you guys have, have my website. Uh, but, you know, you think about when you have a disaster, and we've talked about capability and your capacity to do stuff, hopefully you get funding to fill some of those gaps and you can hire people. But when you're in the middle of that and you've got a million and one things going on, who has the time or wherewithal to write up a job description for a local disaster recovery manager or a grants manager or a grant writer or any of the other, you know, 100 additional positions you might need, especially if you have a major disaster? That's already been done for you. Now, these documents, again, you can modify and tweak as, as necessary. Um, but those types of things um, are out there. Those tool, tools are out there and available for you um, on the library that I have on my website. But there are things that you want to consider, again, before, beforehand. So, you know, if you think, well, we're, we're, we, do we have a grant writer on our staff or somebody that knows how to, you know, apply for grants? Yes or no? Okay, no. Then we're probably going to want to hire one, you know, um, or, or find one through that partnership agreement with a local community, the county, you know, et cetera. So that's what I'm asking you to really take a look at, and that's what this step is really about. We've identified this is a need that we might have. How are we going to fill it? Is the county going to take care of it for us? If we say, hey, can we apply for this grant, the county will do it for us, or we're going to want to hire our own, all right? And then how do you pay for that? That's really what this step is all about, sir. So looking at the local level, mm -hmm. just the example of a leadership, would that be a conflict? Who should be in charge? Uh, the long and short of it is, and I know that you're not going to like this, it depends. Um, and uh, again, that's part of what I was talking about, of doing that own, your own analysis of your community and determining what your capabilities are and what you think your shortcomings are. In the National Disaster Recovery Framework, at least the 20, 2011 version, I'd have to look at the 2016 version, it talks about the local disaster recovery manager and who it should not be. Um, and in many cases, it should not be an emergency management person. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and the reason is, and, and I, I kind of, I, I come in with my military experience and now my working in economic development, I kind of come from both worlds and I can see it that, and this is certainly not any sort of criticism uh, of emergency managers, but they're going to think in a certain way, in a fair, fairly linear way. Um, because that's the way they've been trained to think, and it's great. That's exactly what they need for their skill set. When you're talking long-term disaster recovery, it's more of a, co a collaborative, coordinating kind of function rather than like an ICS kind of structure. So what we're looking for is somebody that understands economic development, understands land use management potentially. Um, again, a lot depends on, on your situation. but so, uh, And really you want somebody that's an expert at coordinating and getting people together to collaborate. <laughs> A business person might be a good one. What we had talked about at the state level when, when we started writing the state disaster recovery plan um, was the idea or the potential that since my position was created and in the at National Disaster Recovery Framework, um, it says the governor appoints this SDRC, even though it also says there's pre-disaster roles for the SDRC. We thought, well, the potential exists, and we've seen this in other states where they do have a disaster and that there's a structure in place, but the governor wants to be involved and say, I'm going to appoint somebody as czar to be in charge. Well, who is that likely to be? 
Well, it's probably going to be somebody with business connections because they understand how to organize, they understand mechanics, functions uh, of organiz large organizations, um, planning, goals, you know, all those types of things. So, so again, <coughs> specifically talking about the local disaster recovery manager, I would think you would want someone with a planning background um, in particular, or potentially with a, or an economic development background. And again, that might change based upon what the impact is on your community. You know, were you hit economically, the downtown business district, or were you hit in the housing sector, you know? Um, so, but the point is, is no matter where you're, where you're talking about, um, there are people in those fields that are good at planning um, and, and coordinating um, rather than, you know, somebody, it's not somebody that's going to sit at a computer and write a plan, basically, your LDRM. This is the guy that's out on the street or hosting meetings or town halls and, and then being able to call me and go, Jeff, we're not getting the help we need. You need, you know, you need we need your help, you know, and to be able to beat the bushes and that kind of thing. So, and again, you multiply that times every position that potentially is a shortfall within your current structure that you have <laughs> and what you think you might need post a d disaster and kind of see that you start peeling back the onion better to think about this kind of stuff now before you have the disaster and go, okay, odds are we're going to need, and that, that guide that LMI has published, and again, that, that I have on my, on my page, um, talks about that and says, and, and the NDRF does as well, saying it's scalable. We don't have to activate all these RSS. We, we might just do housing if it's a housing impact, economics if it's an economic impact. Um, so, you know, you don't have to have to do it all. Um, but you know you got to got to kind of do that analysis a little bit ahead of time, um, and really I think the key is identifying those key decision makers first. Okay, S for example, um, I would hire an LDRM before I hired a grant writer. Okay, because then the LDRM is taking that m burden off of you, off of the mayor, off of the county commissioners, off of the township supervisors, off of the board, um, and they're the ones now doing that analysis and, and saying, okay, do we need a grant manager? Do we need to hire a grant, uh, grant writer or a grant manager? Or you know, can I coordinate through the county or those partnerships that you've already established? Um, that kind of thing, so. Yeah, that's what we were saying back back here is uh, okay. Um, you know, early on, we're going to identify based on historic um, reference, based on Pennsylvania styra that that we do um, here in this room, um, and identify flooding number one. You know, I forget what number two snowstorms or ice storms. I think is number two. You know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry. So, yeah, um, you know, again, you don't know pre-disaster how big your next disaster is going to be. You know, it could be, cat or what it is, it could be catastrophic, you know, in the case of Joplin or Greensboro, or it could be, you know, we flooded 20 houses, okay? Obviously, if it's flooding 20 houses, you probably don't need to do all this that we've talked about as far as hiring additional help. Um, you may be able to get temporary assistance to fill some of those gaps and, and, and not. What we're talking about hiring all this, these extra people is, is a major disaster. But it's better to plan for a worst case scenario than, than, than uh, um, you know, best case scenario. You know, was it Patton? You know, a, a gallon of sweat is better than an ounce of blood. So, um, and then, so we talked a little bit about leadership and then your organizational structure again. You know, do, do you keep what you have right now? Um, are, are we going to go to a committee-based kind of uh, uh, organization with long-term community? Oh, it was on the other slide. Um, okay, this darn thing. So uh, this, you know, it looks like they did a little acronym thing for folks in a town hall or something. Uh, but you have your long-term recovery committees and your long-term recovery organizations. 
you know, are you going to form some of those and create a 501c3 that takes over the responsibility of the long-term community recovery, which is an option. You take the ownership off the, off the community government and get a series of volunteers. If you're a strong enough community, and we talked about resiliency and how strong your community is and, uh, and sense of community earlier on, um, if, you're, uh, <coughs> if you have that type of community, that might be an option. Um, I've got four of them that I deal with regularly, fairly regularly here in Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, Shikshini Forward, uh, Athens Futurescape, um, West Pittston Tomorrow, and uh, Upper Swatera Watershed. Um, they're long-term recovery groups that form 501c3s po post-disaster, and it's concerned citizens. And they have elected chairperson, and in most cases, there's a member of the council that sits in the, the committee, committee, so there's a linkage to the elected officials, um, and it's a good model to use. Um, so, you know, that's an option as well, especially when you're talking limited capacity. And the other problem that you might find um, when you start thinking about temporarily hiring more people to expand your capacity, odds are if you get financing, funding, like through CDBGDR or some of the other disaster funds, it'll be for a finite period of time. And it's usually two years. Like my job was funded by EPA for two years. Then you got to figure out what do we do after that? Do we keep that person on and that, well, now we pay for them? Um, or does that, does that need go away? And then we talk about, well, if you recall, long-term recovery can take up to 10 years. So then there's another gap. So you see, like I said, you know, and, and as we're talking about all this, you start peeling back the onion. If you have a major disaster, there's a lot of things to think about. If you can think about it and write it at least in the concept, ahead of time what you're going to do it makes your life just a little bit easier and that's really what we're looking for okay and then sector specific coordinators so again we've talked about housing education business you know etc those are some of the different types of sector specific coordinators that you're going to you're, you're going to deal with and again do we hire them do we have that sector you know decide who it's going to be like you know you have a, might have a downtown business association Okay, so you have a representative from them. You know, they say, okay, we'll, we'll give you somebody on your planning staff to help work with, you know, develop our plan. Um, that would be ideal because they're representing the group, right? So, of course, you know, you've got to be careful because then they might have an agenda. So, <laughs> all right. So we're about halfway through the, the steps over there um, on that chart. So, you know, three to six, three to nine months, again, this is in your planning horizon, pre-disaster. Um, by now, you should be identifying some of your goals and your priorities and, and uh, um, uh, policies that you're going to um, want to have in, built into the plan. Again, this is challenging because you don't know necessarily what your uh, disaster is, but what could be some goals that you put, um, you know, that are in your pre-disaster recovery plan um, not knowing what your disaster is or, or the impact of the disaster. Sir. Yeah, simple stuff like that. What are your priorities? Okay, um, like so in the Commonwealth, the governor published, not disaster related, but it, it published um, when he first took office, his list of priorities for the Commonwealth. Okay, I think there's six, five or six of them. So we trans translated those into the disaster recovery plan to say like his I think his number one priority and, and I apologize if I get this wrong because um, it's been a while since I looked at it but number one was like jobs getting people back to work okay so we have post disaster governor's priority is jobs I'm gonna say that number one priority is getting people back to work post disaster so I'm using that existing guidance that already s stands for my chief elected official and I'm gonna build that into the plan now is it subject to change at the next election sure but that's you're supposed to revise your plans anyways right so that's okay um, but those are you know those are examples of again how you can think outside the box and go I'm not dealing with a blank sheet of paper I have this reference already somebody that's a chief elected official within your organization your mayor your township supervisor or whatever got elected on a platform of these are my priorities you just translate them into your uh, into your disaster recovery plan your pre-disaster recovery plan now you know again if you get to a disaster in your post-disaster plan and there was no jobs impacted, it's all housing or it's all infrastructure, okay, we can tweak it. But at least lay them out ahead of time and say, this is, this is what our priorities are pre, you know, uh, if we have a disaster. Um, 
and this is where they came from. I mean, obviously, you know, when you have a disaster, it's obviously life, uh, life saving, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, reducing damage, et cetera. But this, we're talking the long term recovery here now. So, um, and then policies is really important too, because, you know, you want to think about it. One example we talk about um, in response phase is things like um, permits for vehicles traveling and exceptions for, for, you know, highways get closed, but we want to get essential services through, so we have to give grant exceptions, or if it's um, utility workers coming from other states that aren't licensed and bonded in Pennsylvania, you know, can we get an exception to, to that? That's more response phase, but you get the ideas. What, what are our policies that we have on the books for our municipal, municipality that we might need to grant waivers to or exceptions for or whatever um, when we have a disaster? It doesn't hurt to look at those ahead of time as well. Okay? And then writing the plan. Um, <coughs> oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Um, again, this all comes out of the APA document that we talked about earlier. Um, it's fairly, fairly simple. Um, you know, you're going to do your little bit of an introduction and why we're doing this and um, talk about our, our leadership. Um, well, we've talked about all this already, some authorities that are inherited in there. You know, who grants... Who has the authority to grant a waiver on X, Y, or Z in a, in the, in a disaster situation? Um, and then we, this is really going to be your meat and potatoes of your operations and your implementation. Um, but this is really good to lay out, you know, some of this stuff. If you think about it ahead of time and you write it into a base plan, you know, it's far better than going, okay, the floodwaters have just receded. Now what are we going to do? That's the whole idea of having this pre-disaster recovery plan is saying, okay, we're going we're gonna to notify, we're going to do this, we're going we're gonna to set up a town hall, we're going to have these, these are the players that we want to have because these are the stakeholders in our community, et cetera. I mean, you just think about it ahead of time instead of going, getting on the backside of the boom and going, oh, we forgot to invite, you know, this nursing home. You know, and their their concerns and and the the role that they play in the community or or that kind of thing. So, so just doing that detailed analysis ahead of time, really about who is important to bring into the mix, um, and and then how are we going to do that? If you can do that before you have a disaster, you're that much further ahead. And then all this stuff is obviously very important. How you know where do we think funding is going to come from? Um, you don't know that, right? at least understand ahead of time what the possible funding sources are. You know, are you going to get CDBG disaster recovery funds? You don't know that and, you know, you don't know you're going to get a Stafford Act declaration. But at least if somewhere in your plan you have them all listed out and saying these are possible sources, here's the point of contact at the state government that does those, you know, that just saves you all that much more time and heartburn later on down the road. Oops. Jumped ahead. Come on. Okay. So then, then the appro approval process. I went through this here in Pennsylvania. So I, I wrote the State Disaster Recovery Plan. Um, I worked with s stakeholder groups. I started with a core planning team, uh, which was mostly here, folks here at Pima in the plan section and Bureau of Recovery. Um, I vetted it out to all the state agencies through the policy offices, and then there came the question, who approves this thing? And that was really where I ran into the, the trouble because technically it's a standalone plan. The Pima director thinks it's a sub-plan of the state emergency operations plan, which is probably the right answer, um, but that wasn't when I was writing it. I didn't think of it in those terms. You know, I thought of it as a standalone plan, a multi-agency plan, not a subset to the state emergency operations plan um, because again you know you have four plans right preparedness response recovery and mitigation so it's it's on par with all of those and then who signs it okay well is, does it have to be signed who decides when it's final and can be published you know so i went through that myself and that's kind of kind of why we're back to square one um, but the point is is you know something that you need to identify and address um, is who's the approval process or approval authority for your plan? Probably just like every other plan. 
um, your land use plan, your comprehensive plan, et cetera. But generally speaking, obviously you want to have those public hearings in the community input because they're the folks that are going to be affected by it, right? And hopefully you've brought them into the planning process already through some town halls, um, et cetera, or opportunity for folks to comment. Nowadays you can hang something on a website and you know you always have those those folks that, I, you know, I guarantee you, I don't go on my township website and look to see what they have posted or any of those types of things or the state one um, to see, you know, public comment period. But there are people that do, which is fine because they have a vested interest in it and they take an interest. And that's what you want. You want that feedback. Sir. Mm-hmm. 